would like to extend a welcome to all who are with us this evening as we continue with our series of holy vessels. We spend our time this week looking at stories, sacred, our stories, all of those stories that feed into our common narrative. Good evening. We continue our Lenten season of recovery as we focus on health as essential to our spiritual lives. who collect beach glass often become archaeologists, seeking out any markings or clues as to the story of the original piece. It often takes much time to bring out the truth behind it. This week we acknowledge the power of truth-telling as a healing property. There are stories that have shaped our lives, leaving us without the ability to see who we truly are in the eyes of God and leaving us without the ability to speak the depth of our stories of struggle. We focus on the importance of recovery of mental health, reclaiming our sense of who we are, and being able to proclaim new redemptive stories of divine worth. that the health of our minds deeply affects our physical and spiritual health. Let us pray. Centering and calming divine breath of God, you gifted us with amazing minds capable of so many things. You gave us the ability to think and feel, imbuing us with discernment of thought and emotion. Like our physical bodies, sometimes this aspect of ourselves is beleaguered. We struggle under the strain of disappointment, despair, and delusion. Too often we hide this, afraid of what others might think of our difficulties in managing or moving forward, even in the face of devastating circumstances. Too often, we perpetuate the stigma of a less-than-perfect state of mind by shaming ourselves and others. Millennia of misunderstanding compounds our fear. We label and belittle, all the while turning the hatred upon ourselves. For no one is immune from troubles of the mind at some point. So many are suffering now, God, weary and distraught, grieving and at the end of their rope. We cannot fathom the proportions of loss, and so we look away, sometimes even from the need in our own community. Help us, healer. Show us our capacity for compassion. Forgive our inattention. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. In this silence, 
we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. I invite you to imagine and search for a warmth at the core of your body. It may help to keep your eyes closed. This warm orb of light is deep within you, although sometimes it feels dulled, even cold. If it feels this way now, allow this. Do not judge yourself. Perhaps you do feel this warmth and all feels right with the world. Just this just is. You likely will not always feel that way. Whether or not you feel the warmth of peace and assurance right now, this does not make you right or wrong, good or bad. It makes you human. And you are not alone. Perhaps you can imagine the warmth coming from someone whose presence fills you with comfort. See it radiate from them to you as it does when you need it most. Know this, you are accepted, no matter what. Accepting the truth of our difficulties is part of the journey of recovery. Sharing our stories of difficulty can open the way for healing, for you, for me, for all. Take a deep breath in to let this truth fill you, and breathe out with the relief of assurance. I invite you to imagine the warmth that surrounds you extending to those who may be next to you in close proximity. Imagine it extending beyond your walls to the neighborhood, the wider community, the church, and seeing it spread like the rising sun. Let it expand to all the world. Let this be our peace. Amen. If you have not already, I invite you to open your eyes. The peace of Christ is with you.
hear these contemporary words, starting with Maya Angelou. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. From Kristen Noel, sharing our truths can provide the opportunity for great healing. Morgan Harper Nichols, tell the story of the mountain you climbed. Your words could become a page in someone else's survival guide. Jerry Cantrell, part of the healing process is sharing with other people who care. One of my favorites, Brene Brown, owning our story and loving ourselves through that process is the bravest thing that we will ever do. Andrea Gibson, sometimes the most healing thing to do is remind ourselves over and over and over. Other people feel this too. Unknown source, the courage it takes to share your story might be the very thing someone else needs to open their heart to hope. And finally, Kim McManus. Your heartache is someone else's hope. If you make it through, someone else is going to make it through. Tell your story. From Matthew 9, verses 27 through 33. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying loudly, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their eyes were opened. Then Jesus sternly ordered them, See that no one knows of this. But they went away and spread the news about him throughout that district. After they had gone away, a demonic, who was mute, was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the one who had been mute spoke. And the crowds were amazed and said, Never has anything like this been seen in Israel. As the liturgy earlier talked about, anybody who happens to be a beachcomber looking for the pieces of glass that wash up, uh, in in some sense has to be a little bit of an archaeologist. You you look at the pieces and try to figure out what was the story, the history of this piece of glass. I picked up a random sample out of the jar that's on the table behind, and I see that it's got uh, two ridges on it. It looks like the marking that came off of some kind of bottle. It's been scratched. It's been worn away. The edges have been smoothed, and you wonder how long was it there? How long were the forces of nature working upon it? I suppose there is a story, but the glass itself is kind of a mute witness to all of that. But stories are important. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of diggering and uh, inference to find out what the story behind something actually is. I think about the, the history of some of the felines we've shared the house with. The second cat that we happened to acquire uh, was a shelter find. We had bought him on one of Abby's birthdays to keep the other cat company. He was a white cat by the name of Gabe. And we didn't know Gabe's story except that Gabe was found as a stray in Sheboygan during a very, very cold snap where temperatures got to be 20, 25 below zero. And there were certain things we could infer from Gabe's history based on his behavior. One was, he obviously hadn't been fed very well, and he immediately kicked into that Scarlett O'Hara syndrome. 
I will never go hungry again. The other thing was that apparently he must have been told never to jump up on the furniture because every time he saw the couch, he would cower and shake. And the other thing was that whoever told him not to go onto the furniture must have been a man. He was very, very leery. It took months for him to finally be comfortable with me being around and knowing that I wasn't going to swat him or yell at him. And I think, too, about the, the cats we currently have in our household, uh, the first one being Ozzy. And Ozzy was surrendered. And Ozzy is at least part Maine Coon, and Maine Coons love people, love to be near them. And the worst thing you could do to a Maine Coon was to surrender them to a shelter. He always had insecurity. If you took him to the vet, he always thought, uh-oh, here we go again. I promise not to do it again. What did I do wrong? And uh, Horizon, the other cat we picked up, was also a stray. She, too, suffered from the Scarlett O'Hara syndrome. I will never go hungry again. But being a stray, she never, ever wanted to go outside. It's like, I've been there, done that, don't need to go back out there again. There are things about their past I can infer, but since they're unable to tell me a whole lot, these are only things I can guess. I do sometimes wonder what their history was like before they came to live with us. People, however, are different from sea glass and cats in that they do have a story, and if you give them a little space, a little room, they'll be happy to tell you their stories. That's one of the things that I've discovered over the years in, in ministry is that if you give people space, people will tell you all kinds of things, um, unsolicited, <laughs> and sometimes they come from different places, but people will tell you things because people want their story to be heard in some way. People have interesting stories, and those stories are part of who they are and part of their journey. Our gospel lesson in Matthew today talks about two men who were blind, who were given their sight by Jesus. And in this particular section of Matthew's gospel, and sort of like it happens in Mark's gospel, whenever Jesus does something, or quite often when Jesus does something, he is encouraged either the person who is on the receiving end of a sign or a miracle or his disciples not to tell anyone anything. I think I get part of why Jesus had wanted to keep some of that quiet. I think people may have been inclined to misunderstand uh, what his mission and ministry was, and even his own disciples probably wouldn't understand truly what he was all about till after the resurrection. There was an easy way for people to misunderstand what his ministry, what his mission and goal was, but you know it's darn near next to impossible for somebody to not tell their story. You can say, don't tell anybody, but that's like the first thing people will do. If you tell them not to say anything, some of them will just say it anyway because the news is too good, the joy too overwhelming to keep to one's self. And so these two men who had their sight recovered to them go and tell their story of what Jesus had done for them. And the telling of our stories is a thing which gives us healing in the long run. There was a similar thought in the Lenten study back the other Monday. What happens to narratives and stories that don't get told? it leads to violence and disorder. You keep the stories silent, you keep all of that tamped down, and like everything else, it will erupt. Uh, you, you've got to be able to tell the story, name the thing, and then you can have some hope for healing and restoration. 
And there are going to be a lot of stories that will be told about what has gone on in the past 12 months, how people's lives have been turned upside down, how people have felt brokenness, And I'm concerned that the pattern that we have seen too much of in these past 12 months is people holding those stories to themselves. It's been a distressing thing to see just what the uptick in depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, all of those kinds of things. And I think in some measure, some of that stems from the fact that nobody allowed them to tell their story or to share their pain or to give that cry for help that comes out of the story. They've either been told directly, you know, suck it up, be quiet, or they were never encouraged to tell what their story is. And and being silent when you are suffering that much when you're caught up in the throes of illness to that extent, is not only unhealthy, it can be fatal. I would hope that we would allow people to feel comfortable telling their stories, that we don't attach stigma to brokenness, whether it's physical brokenness or mental brokenness or spiritual brokenness, that we allow people to go and tell their story because that's all part of the process of healing and recovery. Those stories will be important in the days and weeks ahead. I know it's easy for us to submerge those things and and not talk about them, and I think that's that's a bad thing. If we look back at history, we we talk about the Spanish flu that took place a little over 100 years ago, and by the time we got to the Roaring Twenties, nobody ever talked about the stories that came out of that. They were not well discussed. You know, I can draw back to that in my own family's history. My paternal grandfather's first wife died in that last wave of the Spanish flu epidemic. And that story was seldom told. A lot of pain, I think, that got submerged, undiscovered. You know, I think we do that at our own peril. May God give us the grace and strength to tell our stories, good, bad, and otherwise, and may we find that way to healing and recovery. Amen. Let us pray. Healer of our every ill, especially our malady of stigmatized fear of mental illness, we come before you and make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities and grief of our time. 
You have stamped each of us as worthy. We give you thanks that your mercy is wide and your faithfulness does not depend on us having our feelings all sorted out or a sense of well-being secure. You are not waiting for us to get our act together before offering us your love and grace. We pray especially for those who have experienced heightened and acute mental and emotional difficulties as a result of this past year of isolation and fear. We pray for those who feel far from hope, and we mourn those who could not find a lifeline to survive this hardship. We pray for those who find themselves without access to adequate care, someone to talk to, or appropriate resources to steady their hearts and minds. We give thanks for those who are telling their stories, showing us how to open our hearts to help others and offering ripples of healing in the community. We pray grateful thanks for progress toward holistic health care and efforts of all who are working to destigmatize mental illness, making it easier to ask for and get the help so desperately needed. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate how we as a church can help now and in the future. We pray this day for all those who are experiencing strained relationships, for those who are sick, for Dorothy's daughter-in-law, and for all who are in the need of your presence and healing love. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to do this. Jesus' question invites us to consider our own belief in transformation. He invites us to step into a renewed vision of our lives, to speak into being a new story, not to be bounded by stories of the past, but to inscribe on us by others that we may be oppressing, that may be oppressing or limiting us. Last week in the ritual moment, Pieces of glass were placed in a bowl. And beach glass is usually somewhat cloudy when dry. When it comes into contact with water, it becomes clear and bright. Today, we fill that vessel with water.
In this moment, let us say a prayer for clarity in the midst of this transformation. Ask for a new way to see the struggles you may be experiencing and ask for understanding and a way forward. We come now to this moment in our worship where we dedicate our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. It is not an easy thing to connect our money with God's work. Hear these words of Scripture as they come to us from the letter to the Hebrews in the 13th chapter, verses 15 through 16. Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We will respond with the words of the doxology. heads as we prepare to dedicate these gifts. We thank you, loving God, for showing your love and grace to us. What we have seen and felt in our own lives, we now want to share with those who have not seen and do not know. We now return these gifts for your service. We offer them up for Jesus' sake. Amen. We will continue with our closing song by the Salem Ensemble, There is a Balm in Gilead.
Each week we look at the reaction of the crowd in the healing story. This week the crowd was amazed and cried out that nothing like it had ever been seen before. How interesting that the crowd is seeing something for the first time, just like the blind man is brought to sight. Could it be that this is as important to the story as the ones who receive physical healing? How could we open our eyes, figuratively, in new ways? What do we need to envision anew? And so in our communal discerning about how this church community could become a health hub through our ministry and mission, let us put our minds to imagining how we could shine a positive light on the work of mental health. The needs are so urgent, especially now. Throughout this time, I invite you to explore with us the possibilities for a new or renewed commitment to a contribution we can make at Salem Church to our larger community's effort to recover from this past year. And now hear these words of blessing. Now go with confidence that the one who is living water is already cleansing, renewing, and clarifying our lives recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears. Do you believe it is possible? And may the Spirit hover, move, and deliver salve to your soul and a spring in your step. Let the people of God say, Amen. <laughs>